A survey done by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, released in February of 2008, found that 44% of adults have either switched religious affiliation, moved from being unaffiliated with any religion to being affiliated with a particular faith, or dropped any connection to a specific religious tradition altogether. The same study found that 16% of the persons polled were unaffiliated with any denomination. It's not uncommon for churches to talk about the need to be ecumenical and inclusive in their teachings and interfaith in their outreach, which is really important, and the United Methodist Church is no exception to this. It is definitely God's call on the church, but one must wonder what happens to our doctrine during this push to be ecumenical. Why would someone want to become or remain a United Methodist? What makes the United Methodist Church different from other Protestant denominations? And what is so compelling about our doctrine that someone would want to join our church? To answer these questions, we must first know what United Methodist doctrine is. This video explains the basics of United Methodist Doctrine using information from the Wesleyan Studies Project and other sources. I'll start by defining some key terms. First, doctrine refers to teachings that a Christian church as a community has agreed to by its own process for discerning consensus. Theology is a critical reflection on the Christian faith usually undertaken by individual interpreters in contrast to the corporate or communal discernment involved in doctrine. Lastly, popular religion is what people actually believe and practice, regardless of whether churches approve of it. Methodism encompasses churches with many different styles of worship and teaching within the common doctrine. One of the things that has allowed Methodism to endure is its flexibility and what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, called its Catholic spirit. In his sermon titled The Catholic Spirit, John Wesley described what it meant to have a Catholic spirit as follows. But while he is steadily fixed in his religious principles, in what he believes to be the truth as it is in Jesus, what he firmly adheres to that worship of God which he judges to be most acceptable in his sight. And while he is united by the tenderest and closest ties to one particular congregation, his heart is enlarged toward all mankind, those he knows and those he does not. He embraces with strong and cordial affection neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies, this is Catholic or universal love, and he that has this is of a Catholic spirit, for love alone gives the title of this character. Catholic love is a Catholic spirit. As we cover United Methodist Doctrine in this video, we'll briefly touch on each of the following topics. Authority, Divine Trinity and Christology, Salvation, Provenient Grace, Justifying Faith and Assurance, Sanctification, Ethics, Ecclesiology and Baptism, Eucharist or Holy Communion, Forms of Ministry, and Eschatology. When studying doctrine, it's important to talk about the authority of the Bible, because as Protestants, we believe the authority of the Church is dependent upon the authority of the Bible. But the reverse is not true. Authority is the ground or basis on which churches make claims about Christian beliefs or practices. Biblical inerrancy or infallibility is the idea that the Bible does not err or fail in anything that it teaches, historical or otherwise. The clarity of the Bible is the belief that the Bible's basic message is clear enough for those who read it in such a way that they are open to hear God's word. The sufficiency of the Bible is the notion that the Bible contains everything necessary for our knowledge of salvation and for the reform of the church. As Methodists, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's important to talk about inspiration in relationship to authority because we believe that the Bible reflects God's own authority and reveals God's purpose for redemption. 
Finally, the unity of the Bible is the notion that the Bible contains one basic, beautiful, loving story, namely the gospel message about what God has done in Jesus Christ. The Bible, as our book of faith, weaves together many letters to the early church, historical information, and individual perspectives which offer us an ecumenical understanding of Scripture. By looking through this lens, we can begin to see the Bible less as a text that contradicts itself and instead as a book that aids in interpreting itself when examined as a whole. Thus, Methodists do not affirm biblical inerrancy or infallibility, but instead focus on the unity, sufficiency, and clarity of the Bible. In the 17 and 1800s, during the Enlightenment in European culture, serious doubts were raised about traditional teachings, including the teachings of the Bible. Thus, in addition to scriptural authority, which is primary, the Methodist Church also affirms three other authorities by which Christian teachings and practices ought to be considered. They are tradition, experience, and reason. These four authorities are also known as the quadrilateral, or the Wesleyan quadrilateral. The doctrine of the Trinity is also important to understand. Trinity is a Latin word meaning threeness, which has come to be recognized as representing both the threeness and the unity of God. The parts of the Trinity are Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Methodist doctrine affirms that Christ was both fully divine and fully human, and Methodists assert that there is only one God, but within that God is the mystery of the Trinity and three divine persons, again the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Next we'll talk about the doctrine of salvation. In his sermon, The Scripture Way of Salvation, John Wesley said the following about salvation. What is salvation? The salvation which is here spoken of is not that what is frequently understood by going to heaven. It is not a blessing which lies on the other side of death, but it is a present thing. It might be extended to the entire work of God from the first dawning of grace in the soul till it is consummated in glory. Methodism teaches that God's grace is free and universally offered to all people, even those who may have a different faith or religion. While we believe and wish to offer the love and mercy of Christ to all people, we also accept that God reveals God's self to others in God's own way, and in the fullness of time will offer all people the opportunity to become children of God and followers of Christ. We cannot earn our salvation. Salvation is a process of human agents reacting to the ever-present love of God, to grace extended to the chief of sinners. If there were one word used to describe Methodist doctrine, it would in fact be grace. In John Wesley's sermon, The Witness of Our Own Spirit, he said that grace can sometimes be understood as that free love, that unmerited mercy by which I, a sinner, through the merits of Christ, am now reconciled to God. John Wesley believes that God's grace was available to all people, even before we acknowledge it. This is called preventing or prevenient grace. It is present in our lives, guiding us and sustaining us, preparing us for the next steps that God has for us. It's important to note that provenient grace is not irresistible grace, which indicates conversion simply because we are chosen persons of God. Those Calvinist thoughts which state that persons who do not accept salvation are simply not a part of the elect, and thus God did not extend grace to save them, are not a part of Methodist doctrine. As Methodists, we believe in the free salvation offered to all people and the free will of persons to either accept the salvation offered to them or reject it. Methodists also believe in the doctrine of justifying faith or grace, which means that we believe salvation is a gift from God. There's nothing we could ever do to earn salvation, but Jesus has already justified us by suffering death for our sins. 
We are therefore offered the gift of salvation through no action on our part aside from accepting the invitation of Christ and inviting Christ to live in our heart. We also know that we are saved because we have assurance. This means simply that we belong to God because we know that Christ lives in our hearts. While Methodists see conversion as a vital part of our lives with Christ, we believe it is only a door into our life and relationship with God. Sanctification, yet another way in which God's grace is revealed to us, is a process by which we gradually are changed to be more like God. To desire what God desires, to do what God would have us to do, sanctification is not always a warm and happy place to be. But it is necessary for growth. It is a place of confidence and assurance, but also one of growth and change. We believe that as Christians we are called to offer Christ to the world. We do not believe that this can be done appropriately without taking up social justice causes and addressing the suffering in the world. Charles Wesley's hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, really addresses what we mean by sanctifying grace of God that pushes us to be more like God and to be in closer relationship with God. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee. The Methodist doctrine on ethics reflects a way of living which addresses the moral and ethical code of its members. John Wesley created a list of general rules which he believed were best for attaining holiness. The first is to do no harm. The second is to do good, and the third is to attend upon the ordinances of God. Attending upon the ordinances of God refers to the attendance of church services, prayer, fasting, and communion. The terminology has been adjusted in modern times to stay in love with God, but the meaning is the same. Doing good, of course, refers to being active in social justice arenas. Slavery was a big issue for John Wesley, and poverty and equality are still concerns for the church today. Ecclesiology is the doctrine of the church. United Methodist Doctrine shows four marks that are required of the universal church. They are faith, preaching, sacraments, and a discipline of accountability. Methodists believe that the church is divine and human invisible and visible, and a gift from God as well as a calling to be faithful to God. The church believes in two sacraments. Baptism in the United Methodist Church is a gift of grace from God and an act of initiating us into a covenant with God. Infant baptism is practiced in the UMC because children are seen as in need of God's grace and in need of the relationship that is formed with the church in the act of baptism. For United Methodists, baptism is not required in order to be saved, but it is required in order to enter into membership in the church. Additionally, the act of baptism does not guarantee a relationship with God, because salvation is through faith. One must actively and consistently seek to live a holy, disciplined life. Baptism is a means of grace through which God acts. It initiates believers into the church and into a relationship with God. It is transformational in that it can be a symbol of an inward regeneration unto God or being born again. It is also formational because it places us into a Christian community. And finally, as Methodists, of course, baptism is missional. We believe that in baptism we are called to participate in the ministry of Christ, offering that perfect love of God to the world. Eucharist is also known as Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, Mass, or Blessed Sacrament. Each term has a slightly different meaning, but all refer to the action of remembrance of the Last Supper, where Jesus drank wine and ate bread with his disciples. Charles Wesley's hymn, Oh, the Depth of Love Divine, recognizes the mystery and beauty present in the Eucharist. Oh, the depth of love divine, the unfathomable grace, 
Who shall say how bread and wine into us conveys? How the bread his flesh imparts, how the wine transmits his blood, fills his faithful people's hearts with all the life of God. If you ever join a UMC for Holy Communion, you may notice that the wine is unfermented grape juice, or that you're given an option of fermented or unfermented wine. The United Methodist Book of Worship explains this in the following way. Although the historic and ecumenical Christian practice has been to use wine, the use of unfermented grape juice by the United Methodist Church and its predecessors since the late 19th century express a pastoral concern for recovering alcoholics. It enables the participation of children and youth and supports the church's witness of abstinence. Additionally, you will hopefully notice that communion is open to all. The United Methodist Ecumenical Commitment from the UM Book of Discipline states, We invest ourselves in many ways by which mutual recognition of churches, of members, and of ministries may lead us to sharing in Holy Communion with all of God's people. There are two very important ways of participating in the ministry of the church. They are the ministry of all Christians to which Every person who responds to the love of God and believes in Christ becomes a disciple. And the ministry of the ordained, which can be as a deacon, leading the church and relating Christians to their ministries in the world, or as an elder, itinerant clergy primarily working in the church, or extension ministries administering sacraments and caring for congregations. Additionally, the Methodist Church has local pastors who are not ordained, but are licensed to preach and conduct divine worship and perform the duties of a pastor. They are appointed, but need not make themselves available as itinerant ministers. And they may also serve in extension ministry settings. When talking about forms of ministry, it's also important to mention the district superintendent. This is especially understood as an extension of the office of the bishop. The district superintendent oversees the ministry of the clergy and the churches in the communities of the district, a task that requires pastoral leadership, personal leadership, administration, and program leadership. We also cannot overlook bishops. Bishops play an important role in leading and ordering the life of the church and helping set the direction to fulfill its mission in the world. All bishops share in teaching, equipping, and encouraging mission and service. They serve as shepherds of the entire church, providing a prophetic witness for justice and unity. I conclude with a brief description on the Methodist doctrine of eschatology. Eschatology comes from the New Testament Greek word for eschatos, which means last. Eschatology deals with Christian hope, our hope for God's future, both for individual persons and for the whole of creation. Methodists believe that God will offer redemption and restoration to all of God's creation. We believe in the proper care of animals and our planet as God's precious creation, and we acknowledge God's redemptive power is not limited to just humans. Again, I reference a hymn by Charles Wesley. Lo, he comes in clouds descending. Lo, he comes in clouds descending, once for favored sinner slain, Thousand, thousand saints attending, swell the triumph of his train. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus appears on earth to reign. So there's your overview of United Methodist Doctrine. But I return to the question, why would someone want to be a United Methodist? The doctrine of the United Methodist Church is flexible. While it is reached through communal agreements, it also allows for individual interpretation in many ways. The doctrine is not set in stone. Although it takes time and is potentially frustrating, United Methodist doctrine can and does change and become more inclusive. The ordination of women, the order of the deacon, and desegregation are just a few examples of this. One thing that I find compelling is that the United Methodist Church respects science from the social principles we recognize science as a legitimate interpretation of God's natural world. We affirm the validity of the claims of science in describing the natural world. 
although we preclude science from making authoritative claims about theological issues. The missional focus of the United Methodist Church, of course, is important to note as well. John Wesley spent his life caring for the poor, the widowed, the orphans, the prisoners, and he made sure that this call from God was placed on the people called Methodists. For me, the most valuable thing about United Methodist teachings is the doctrine surrounding how God's grace is offered to the world and the many ways in which our language has developed around grace. Understanding God's grace as a gift given freely and universally is a promise and a hope that is unmatched. No matter who you are or what you've done, God offers God's love to you and you are welcome here at God's table. I hope that you'll join us.